I'm here to talk to you today about XRF as applied to plating thickness measurement. Um, and again, I'm with Bowman Analytics. We're located uh, just outside of Chicago here in the US. Um, so first of all, I wanna talk about, you know, different types of metal plating that we encounter. I, I, I underlined metal plating because that's really what we're focused on. I'll get a little bit more into the capabilities of XRF as it applies to, to plating thickness measurement. But um, this is a, uh, a field that I, I found people have very different um, levels of knowledge on plating uh, from none at all to, uh, you know, people that maybe been in the industry. But basically, a lot of materials out there are, uh, it's a lot more, basically, it's a lot more cost effective to take a low cost steel or aluminum and plate it with a very thin coating of a different type of metal that either makes it look uh, more pretty, you know, more decorative, more shiny, uh, gives it a color property that you're looking for, or gives it a protective property. If it's a piece of steel that's going to go underwater, obviously it's going to rust pretty quickly, but you put some sort of protective coating, something like uh, nickel, chrome, something that's not going to, to rust like the steel would. And then the, the actual surface that's coming into contact with that environment is, uh, is fully protecting the actual structural metal that's underneath. Um, and then in electronics, a lot of times you want a highly conductive uh, material. And so you might take something that's uh, somewhat conductive, you know, something like, uh, like aluminum, and coat it with something like copper or gold that is you know, the most conductive for electronic uh, flow that, that you can achieve. So there's a lot of different reasons that uh, there are different types of plating used. And here I've just listed a few. Um, you know, nickel and gold are, are some of the, the plating types that we encounter quite a bit uh, for a lot of different types of, uh, of applications. And there are a lot of different ways that these metals are plated onto the different uh, types of parts that we encounter. Uh, electrolytic plating being the most common. Um, there's something called electroless plating, which is a catalytic reaction where there's uh, no electricity used. And it's basically just a chemical reaction that deposits metals onto the substrate. Um, there are immersion coatings that are basically, again, a catalytic reaction where you, know, you, you, you start a reaction and then it just works on its own. Um, there are ways to, to physically deposit uh, metals onto uh, to different substrates by creating a plasma and basically atomizing a piece of metal, and then it sort of rains down onto uh, a metal substrate. So it's, it's, it's a pretty cool um, industry and a pretty cool uh, sort of a technique if you've never looked into it. But these are just some of the, the common metals that we work with. And again, I'll get more into uh, to why I'm focused on metals here shortly. Um, and then again, some of those industries that we work with a lot, um, you know, printed circuit boards, uh, they need a, a protective coating to make sure that the copper that is sort of the, the main underlying layer in the, the circuitry of a, of a printed circuit or wiring board uh, doesn't, again, doesn't oxidize, doesn't, uh, doesn't lose those uh, conductivity properties that are so desired. And, and you also need to be able to solder different components, you know, resistors, capacitors, chips, things of that nature need to be soldered onto the, the actual wiring uh, assembly. So a lot of times, as you'll see in the picture, gold is the top coating that's used because gold doesn't corrode. So it's very protective. Again, and you don't lose any of that conductivity. So that's a very common application. We run into uh, semiconductors, you know, or of course, those have been in the news a lot <laughs> lately, and uh, they're just becoming more and more, um, uh, we're, we are becoming more and more reliant on all those, those fancy chips that seem to go into everything that we use now. So that's a big industry for us. Uh, you know, all kinds of different things, uh, general metal finishing, things like fasteners, uh, different, uh, just hardware components, uh, you know, all, all the little things that, again, just are pieces of a larger puzzle, you know, all the little 
components that go into making an automobile or an airplane, uh, so many of those are, are, are plated with a protective coating. Um, and, and, and those, those properties of those, those coatings are, are very stringent and something that's going up into, into the air, carrying people around or going up into space and, you know, trying to look out into the galaxies and we, you know, have to rely on that, uh, that, that telescope or that satellite to communicate or, or again, look into, look into the past, you know, as you will. Um, and then, you know, plumbing parts, you know, the, the, the fancy faucet you have in your kitchen is probably plated with some kind of a, a nickel or a, or a chrome plating, give it that, that fancy reflective shine to it. So just all sorts of different parts are, are plated. And we work with all these different industries um, because they, they may be di very different um, at face value, but they're all using uh, XRF to, to monitor the plating thickness of, of whatever metals they might be plating onto whatever parts they might work with. And why would they even bother to measure the plating thickness? Well, there's quite a few reasons. Uh, this sort of simple diagram just is, is a, a basic uh, uh, sort of illustration of some of the, the most simple reasons why they might need to measure plating thickness. Um, you know, as you see in the top little hand trying to fit that little peg into the, <laughs> the hole there, if, if something is plated on too thick, then it, may, it might not fit together with whatever it's, uh, it's needing to screw into or, or slide against or, or again, just sort of fit, fit into the, the, the whole assembly of whatever might be, uh, be the complete product. Uh, if you're plating something like gold or or platinum, you know something like plating jewelry, and you just want a thin decorative coating, you sure don't want to put any more gold or platinum or palladium on there than you need to because that stuff is expensive. Um, and sometimes as a plating gets thicker, it it has poor physical characteristics. You know, it becomes brittle. It it doesn't adhere as well. It starts to flake off, and the the, the you know the color or the corrosion properties might might uh, start to, to diminish. So there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to overplate. Of course, in the middle, if, if there's a specification, usually there's a minimum and a maximum uh, thickness specified. And of course, uh, the, the, the production people want to be right in, in, the, in that spec. And again, if you're working with gold, you want to be on the low end of that spec just to uh, control overall costs. And then on the, the lower end, you see underplated. You, you can imagine that could get you into trouble uh, because if something like uh, like uh, protective coating is plated too thin, it might wear off and and expose that base metal to to corrosion or or to you know oxidation or any you know any any type of uh, wear that that uh, the coating was put on there to protect. Um, you know, a common one is uh, your phone charger it has those little gold leads on it, those little finger pads. If you look at it. Uh, there's a coating on there called hard gold, typically, and it's very conductive, but it's, it's called hard gold because the, the manufacturer knows you're going to be putting that little plug in and out of your phone thousands of times over the life of your phone. And so it's designed to be able to uh, withstand those, those multiple rubbing of the, the actual, you know, those little uh, conductive fingers against your phone plug all, over and over. And so it needs to be a certain minimum thickness to, to withstand all that, all that wear and tear over time. Uh, and if it's too thin, it's going to wear out faster. So um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of reasons why you need to test for, for plating thickness. Um, some of the capabilities that I alluded to here, uh, first of all, we get asked the question a lot, you know, what can you measure? Well, we can measure basically any metallic element. So if you look at the periodic table, basically we're, we're talking about elements uh, 13, aluminum, all the way up to you know uranium, which it, it, practically speaking, <laughs> nobody's plating uranium, but that's just kind of the, the common metal that, that everybody just sort of ends at. So basically we can measure any of those elements in between, uh, but anything lower atomic element than aluminum or lighter element, if you will, uh, we are only measuring in uh, a, an air environment typically, and I'll get it more into the hardware of the systems. Uh, but so, so I'll, I'll talk more about what we can't do, but basically we're talking a metallic uh, 
uh, coding that we're, we're focused on. We can measure single or multiple layered uh, applications. Um, you know, there are a lot of complex multi-layer applications. I've listed a few common ones here. Uh, there's one in the, if you're in the printed circuit board world called INAPIG, and that stands for uh, Electrolyst Nickel, Electrolyst Palladium, and Immersion Gold. So it's a, it's a well-known uh, PCB coating that basically allows the, the board to be protected and it's very highly solderable and these coatings can be very thin. So it's just a common one we work with. Um, a lot of times if you look at some of the components in your car, uh, especially on the dashboard around like the, uh, the, the handles of, of your doors, um, you know, the trim along your windows, things like that, it'll be very shiny. And that's typically a thin chrome plating that's put on a multi-layer. It's got nickel under it, copper underneath that, and then it's actually a plastic component that's put in. So it looks metallic, but it's actually plastic. And so that just allows the manufacturer to cut down on cost and weight in the overall uh, vehicle. So a lot of multi-layer applications. And then there's a lot of just single layer applications we work with as well. Um, you know, again, typically things like nickel pop up a lot um, and, and a lot of other single uh, layer applications. Uh, we can measure alloys, uh, a zinc nickel on steel coating is one we run into a lot. So we can measure both the uh, thickness and the composition of uh, an application like that. So that's something we can do simultaneously. And then I get the question a lot, you know, what thickness range can you measure? I'll get a bit more into that, but we're typically talking in the, the, the level of micron, submicron levels, you know, around one nanometer up to around 100 microns of thickness, but it really depends on the elements involved. So again, I'll get more into that. Uh, things XRF cannot do would be any of those elements that are lower than, than 13 on the periodic table. So anything, any organic type coatings, uh, plastic, you know, non-metallic type coatings, paints, you know, a lot of paints uh, have a, a, a metallic component in there. A lot of times something like uh, titanium or, or copper, something to help the, the color uh, be more vibrant. Uh, you know, we, we can sometimes do that, but there are inexpensive gauges, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, you can get a gauge to measure paint thickness. So we don't really focus on that. Um, anodizing, we cannot do because that just forms an oxide layer on the aluminum. So we, that really doesn't change the elemental properties of the coating at all. So we can't do that. Um, and, and then when coatings get very thick, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that's used in decorative plating a lot is, is called hard chrome. Like think of a motorcycle and how it's shiny. You know, you think of like the exhaust pipe and the, the side of the motorcycle. A lot of those are really thick coatings that we can't measure or things called like metallized or spray coating, something that's kind of like metallically sprayed on for something that's uh, uh, like big rollers used in industry to flatten things out. We can't measure those because they're just too thick. Um, as in any XRF, we can't determine the valency uh, you know, or the actual molecular, molecular structure of material. And we can't distinguish between layers of the same element. So if you had something like copper plated on brass, which is a copper alloy, we can't really tell where the copper is coming from because you got a copper based metal with copper plated on top. So you basically have to fix one or the other. You know, so if we know what the content of the brass substrate is, if we fix that copper composition, measure the, the, the brass substrate as is, then measure the copper plated substrate, then we can kind of subtract what that base signal was out of that. But without knowing what that was to start with, we can't distinguish where it's coming from. So again, these are common limitations of any XRF. Just wanted to point that out. Uh, again, getting on the, the thickness range, because I get asked that a lot. Here's a periodic table showing the different elements and the different ranges at the bottom. As you can see, it varies quite a bit. Uh, this is really dependent on the, the actual characteristic energy of the X-rays that are fluoresced, uh, you know, based on the, the element. Um, again, you can see sort of on the, the low end, if we're looking at things, um, you know, like uh, aluminum um, up through, you know, around titanium, we can't measure those real thick. 
but then you get up into something like uh, tin or silver or, or cadmium, which are pretty common platings. And we can measure those up to you know, over 100 microns in thickness. Uh, so it does vary pretty widely, uh, depending on the element. Um, so the basic principles uh, of how we, we measure the coating thickness is we are, you know, like any XRF, we have a, an X-ray tube that's generating the, the primary X-rays. So we're, we're typically running our tube, and again, I'll get more into the hardware. We're, we're typically running our tube at a 45 kV uh, energy range. And, and so that's enough energy to typically get through all the different layers that we're working with. Um, the, the layer, you know, whatever layers on top, like if you look in this simple little diagram, I've got gold plated over nickel in sort of a, a schematic here. So the, you know, the top layer of gold in this case, that intensity is going to be the, you know, the strongest because it's the x-rays that are coming out of the, you know, the surface. And that, that the intensity of the uh, fluoresced x-rays is an exponential function that changes as, as thickness increases. So you see the little graph down there, basically uh, starting from sort of zero to what we would call an infinite thickness where the x-rays just don't increase anymore and we can't measure any thicker. You know, it's an exponential function. So if, if you were to zoom in on sort of the low end and the high end of thickness, there's kind of these linear ranges uh, on the thin and thick ends of things. And a lot of times that's where we're working. And then in the middle, it's sort of second order curve. Uh, and then if you look at the, uh, the bottom layer, in this case, the nickel, you know, that's just sort of the, the inverse relation to um, the gold because the nickel x-rays are getting absorbed more and more, of course, as the gold gets thicker because those nickel x-rays have to get all the way back up through the gold layer to get back to the detector. So, you know, I kind of tell people, you have to think when somebody says, how thick can you measure? We have to think in this simple schematic, we have to be able to measure that very bottom layer of nickel atoms. Those x-rays at the very bottom have to be able to get all the way back up through all the other nickel atoms and all the way through all the gold atoms on top to get up through both layers to the detector. So you have to kind of think about it in that way. We have to be able to measure that very bottom or in, and that has to be able to get all the way back up through, or else, of course, we won't know where that bottom is. But that's the basic principle we're working with. Um, so kind of on that note, uh, you know, to limit us if something is too thick, again, it depends on what the, the makeup is of those, those different layers. I've got a, a picture here of gold plated over nickel, over copper, over iron, or steel. And so you have to think about you know, if I needed to measure the nickel and the copper, let's say underneath the gold, well, I have to know how thick that gold is going to get. And I know from experience that if the gold is over, is more than about three microns thick, you can forget about measuring anything underneath it because gold is very dense. You know, the, the atoms are very large compared to something like nickel or copper. And those weaker nickel and copper x-rays just aren't going to be able to penetrate through that gold uh, for very, uh, very long distance. Uh, if it's less than three microns, then we've got a good chance of, of measuring the, the sub layers. But again, if we're looking at copper, then we have to consider, okay, how thick is the nickel? Um, you know, if nickel is more than, I don't know, 10 or 12 microns and gold's two or three microns, you know, that all adds up to where, again, that copper has to get all the way back up through both those layers. So it's a little bit of a kind of a complex equation when you're doing multiple layers, but, uh, you know, that's why, um, you know, uh, people like me are, are, are in this industry to help answer those questions. And uh, we help our customers with, with determining some of these complex applications they're looking to do. Um, on the other end, if uh, something is getting too thin, then there's just not enough actual x-ray intensity to measure. Um, and a lot of that's going to depend on the, the actual hardware of the XRF, which I'll, I'll talk about in the next slides. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of the same uh, uh, hardware components as general XRF uh, instruments out there. You know, the detector type is going to be a big factor in how thin we can measure. Um, you know, these days for our instrumentation, a, a silicon drift detector uh, with a large collection window is going to give you the best sensitivity. 
Uh, it's going to be able to capture the most, you know, counts from the signal, the the uh, the sample, and so that's going to give you the lowest uh, detection limits or the thinnest measurable uh, coding range. Uh, the X-ray tube target uh, is important because we can actually choose the anode type uh, based upon what the application is that we're trying to measure. If it's something really thin, uh, our typical tube target we use is tungsten, just because that's a pretty good general purpose. Um, uh, uh, tube target, and it's a good robust tube, uh, but we can use you know, other things like chrome, rhodium, moly, or typically some of the others that we use if, if somebody is looking for specific application sensitivity. And then I'll talk about the, the collimators, which control the spot size, and then the primary filters that we apply, which basically, you know, go between the x-ray tube and the sample. Um, depending upon those, uh, that'll control the, the ability to measure a, a thinner uh, coating. Um, but, you know, when we're talking very thin, which I would consider anything less than about 10 nanometers, typically we're only going to be focused on the top layer um, unless all of the coatings are very thin. Just because, again, if, if something's, you know, you got a two nanometer coating buried under something that's five microns thick, you can imagine that that doesn't have much, much hope to get all the way through that thick uh, upper coating. Uh, again, I would just wanted to show this. Uh, periodic table with the last couple of slides in mind for you to look at just if you had any particular interest in any of these uh, elements here. Um, so again, the, the uh, XRF instruments we deal with have a lot of the exact same components I'm sure you're, you're already familiar with. You know, you have the X-ray 2 with the different targets I discussed. And then you have uh, different primary filters that are in a, a little assembly that moves back and forth. And those kind of dial in the, ex, the excitation kind of acts as a, as a high pass filter to filter out some of the lower energy x-rays depending on the, the, the elements that we want to improve the signal to noise ratio on. Uh, the collimators, which, uh, you know, I. I assume you might have, be familiar with the term, but basically in, in this case, it's an aperture to control the spot size. I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, we have a camera that's there to give you a live image for aligning your sample uh, because we're, we're dealing with some very small features in certain cases. And then of course we have our detector, which is a, a typically a silicon drip detector uh, with the digital pulse processor to, to, to process the signal that we're collecting. And then, of course, everything's uh, processed by a PC that everything's hooked up to to run the software and all the algorithms. And we work with uh, you know Windows 10 and, and now 11 as we're getting into that next uh, fun operating system. So uh, this is a, a, a little uh, schematic of, of how the internal guts, if you will, of our system is put together. Um, one thing that might be different from XRF that you might be used to is we're actually measuring from the top down. So this is how the x-ray tube is actually positioned. Uh, kind of hard to see, but the, the exit window is pointing down towards the sample. I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but we got kind of a zoomed in version here to show how you know the primary filters, the collimators, and the detector and everything are positioned. We try to get everything as, as close together as possible to maximize the signal getting to the sample and then the signal getting back from the sample to the detector just to where we can you know, collect the most uh, flux to and from uh, the sample that we're, we're measuring. Um, so I mentioned the collimator. And again, that's uh, simply an aperture that limits the x-rays that uh, can, can get through to control the actual spot size that gets the sample. But we actually have another way that we can we can focus the uh, x-rays down on a sample. So I guess I should uh, rewind real quick and say, you know, a lot of times in our world with, with coding thickness measurement, we're dealing with, especially in electronics, semiconductors, printed circuit boards, we're dealing with sometimes very, very, very small features or very, very small parts. Uh, you know, on a printed circuit board, you've got these tiny little little pads or tiny little circuits that we're dealing with that are, you know, sometimes uh, only a couple of hundred microns in size or even smaller. And so we have to be able to focus our x-ray beam down onto that feature uh, 
um, and, and, and zoom in with a, a you know, nice uh, high resolution video image of that as well, just to make sure the beam is getting right on that, that area to be measured. Because you know, when we're measuring plating thickness, we, need to, we have to go straight down through the cross section of that, that plating layer or else we won't get accurate results. And so to focus the beam, we have two different uh, ways of doing that. We have a collimator, which you see on the left, which, which is an inefficient way to uh, focus the x-rays because it's basically a brass block with a little hole milled through it. And any of the x-rays that don't fit in that little gap are absorbed by the brass plate. And so you know, you, you basically, if you see the intensity chart on the right, what starts off as a high intensity coming off the tube ends up as just a, a trickling of the original x-rays that actually can make it through that, that hole. And the smaller the, the hole, the smaller the aperture, the smaller the collimator, or whatever you want to call it, uh, the less x-rays that actually get through to the sample. So the, the you know, the performance is, is, is hurt because you have fewer x-rays getting to the sample. So to get some good signal, you need to test for longer. Uh, so we always try to use the biggest collimator we can based upon the feature size, but we're limited by the feature size. Now, when, when features get very small, and I would call that anything less than, you know, maybe a couple of hundred microns, then you start to use collimators that are so small that it just becomes in a, an inefficient way to, to measure a sample. So we use what we call polycapillary optics. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, think of like fiber optics, how they, they can focus uh, a light through a tube that's very long and, and, and uh, keep the same level of brightness. Basically this uses total internal reflection to where the X-rays are, are reflected inside the optics assembly and they're focused to a very, very small spot down to seven microns on the sample surface. So you get a really small spot with almost 100% of the x-rays that were coming out of the window right at the exit window. So uh, it's a very efficient way to focus the x-rays, but it's also very expensive. <laughs> so you know the advantage of the collimator is it's very cheap to just kind of physically uh, uh, machine these these holes through this uh, brass plate and then the optics requires some really uh, high tech engineering. So, um, but we've got, you know, again, something to, something for everybody uh, with either option. And then here's a sort of a breakdown of, of, of typical collimator sizes and optic sizes. Um, typically with our standard system, we have four different collimators that are just software selectable. It goes from 100 to 600 microns. Uh, we have smaller and bigger uh, collimator sizes to choose from, but that's, that typically covers most people's requirements. And then on the, the capillary optic side, we go again, like I said, down to seven and a half microns is our smallest. And then we have a couple other flavors at uh, 15 and 80 microns. And and basically, the smaller the optics, the more expensive it is. So, again, we just try to offer um, different uh, different options based upon people's, you know, requirements and their budget. Over on the right, this is we basically use a a, a special piece of paper that's sensitive to X-rays. Uh, we we basically turn the the uh, the tube on, and for the different collimator size, we run it for 30 or 60 seconds, and it burns a little image on the paper to show us how how big the actual spot size is. So this is how we actually actually measure the spot size that we're measuring. Um, this is just a, a snapshot of the, the software interface. Uh, you know, any coding thickness XRF system is going to be very similar as far as, you know, of course, you're going to have a, a view of the spectrum, the raw data that you're collecting. Um, you're going to have different applications. Uh, that you can choose from because you know if you're a plating shop, some kind of like a job shop that does a lot of different things, you might be you might have 50 different processes that you're doing from silver to tin to cadmium to zinc to you know whatever gold nickel, and then over on the right side um, you see the actual readout of the different coating layers. So it's kind of a kind of a diagram of how the layers are are actually plated. And then a breakdown of the the thickness, and then if it's an alloy, the the composition as well of that particular plating layer. So, 
just wanted to kind of show you how, how a typical software screen looks. Um, and then as far as setting up a calib new calibration goes, um, this is just a, a typical screen that's gonna you know, let you build the, the, the calibration or the application. Um, typically you can measure up to five uh, different coding layers. And then you can measure uh, up to, you know, depends on, on who you're working with, but up to 30 elements per layer is typically what you can measure. It's a little bit uh, outside of the normal practical range, but, um, you know, in, in some applications, uh, there are quite a few elements involved in, in a layer. Um, and then we're using as the, the actual calculation algorithm, we're using fundamental parameters. So uh, hopefully you all are, are familiar with that FP uh, algorithm that's uh, uh, pretty commonly used in any type of, of compositional or in this case, thickness analysis. So uh, basically you just define the different layers and then you can move on to adding standards. Now, uh, in, in our case, um, we, we do have this FP calibration. And so since that has all of the, the theoretical you know, constants that are, that are added into that, you can do standardless measurement um, and that's, that's fine. Um, you could also do an empirical calibration where you just build things from scratch, but that's kind of a little bit old school and it's rarely used in our industry uh, because the FP has gotten so good over the years. Uh, but we do recommend to apply calibration standards. You know, it's, it's gonna give you the best accuracy and it allows you to, to verify the accuracy of the calibration over time. I mean, like any XRF equipment, calibration is gonna drift over time. So you need to be able to, to monitor that. And when it does drift out of your, your tolerance level, your acceptance level, you can uh, remeasure the standards, kind of dial things back in. Um, also, it, it allows you to have the traceability. Uh, you know, these standards are NIST traceable. And so if you're, you're, you know, your customer wants to see that or you're getting audited, you know, it's good to have those traceable standards. Um, in our thickness world, we have a couple of different varieties. We have uh, thickness foils, and I'll show you an image of that. And, and basically in these foils, you know, if you are plating with say gold over nickel over copper um, you, and, and your gold was 10 micron, or let's just say your gold was one micron and your, your nickel was 10 microns, you would want to get a gold foil right at around one micron and a nickel foil right around 10 microns. And then you would literally physically stack those on top of each other over the copper substrate. So it's kind of a little bit, bit uh, probably a, a different way of looking at things, but that, that, that is a close enough representation of how the actual metals are plated in your process to, to be a good representation to actually uh, create a good calibration for that. Um, in other cases, some people prefer to have an actual plated standard where in the same scenario, you would have gold plated on nickel plated on a piece of copper. And, um, you know, that, that substrate, or sorry, that standard would be a, a little bit closer representation of the actual plated material, of course, because it is plated, but also it's more robust. These foils, as I'll show you here, these foils are, are, are pretty thin. And you can imagine a, a foil that's, you know, a, a few nanometers thick, you know, you sneeze on it and the thing uh, blows up. <laughs> so sometimes they're so thin, you actually have to have uh, some, some piece of like mylar or something on the back of it, something that's transparent to x-rays to actually give it more, uh, more strength because uh, it's such a thin, thin, uh, weak foil. So Again, these can just be stacked on top of each other. They can be single or multi-layered uh, foils that are mounted onto these, these thin little, uh, uh, little uh, mounting uh, sandwiched little plates. And then you lay those over the substrate, you put them into the machine and you measure them. And then again, that, that represents your, your actual plating process and they are NIST traceable. Um, and then once you, you know, lay those in, measure them, you get a, a regression curve. Again, you've typically got a second order type of a, uh, a relationship between uh, thickness and intensity. This is just a quick screenshot to show you, um, you know, how things go from sort of zero to infinite thickness. 
And the, the little dot in the center there represents the standard that was measured. So again, we've got the FP engine running that draws the best fit curve, uh, typically a second order curve, unless you're on the, the very low or very high end that I, I had explained earlier, the thickness range, and then it's a more of a first order relationship. Um, but this is how we, we capture the curve. Um, and then um, something else that uh, our customers uh, tend to, to like is our ability to do so solution analysis. So if you're, a, if you're an actual plater and you're running a plating shop, uh, you have these huge baths of solution that, that uh, contains your plating material. And, and these are kind of complex solutions. They've got, you know, all of the, if you're doing electroplating, it's got the different uh, anodes and things in there to, to make the electricity run through to plate the materials. You've got all kinds of, of stabilizing chemicals, salts and things to control the pH. But you've got, you've got your actual plating analyte. Let's just say it was gold. You've got to have gold ions in solution swimming around there to be able to get from one point A to point B to pl plate onto your sample. And so you want to be able to monitor the concentration of that plating analyte in your solution. And you can do that with XRF as well. And um, you know this is this is something that uh, it has become more popular over the years, just because if you're getting an XRF for for measuring plating thickness, then you might as well measure the the solute the plating solution as well. So what I've got here is a picture of our solution cup, and since we're measuring from the top down, it gets a little tricky to measure solutions because we want to have a, a consistent volume that we're presenting to the uh, the X-ray beam, and so what we do is. If you see sort of that little piece on the right, we basically put a few drops of solution onto that little metal shiny uh, plated surface. And you kind of, it kind of creates like a reverse meniscus, sort of a bubble. And then you lie, you lay a piece of mylar over the top of that. And then you snap that other piece on top. And then a little bit of the solution will overflow to that little uh, rim around there that'll catch any drops of extra solution that flow down there. And, and then you've got a consistent volume inside of that, uh, that little shiny area. And the reason that there's a metal uh, there and that that's, that's molybdenum typically is because you know, the, the solution is going to scatter the X-rays quite a bit because it's, it's you know, a light matrix material. And by having that molybdenum as the base, that's gonna uh, uh, give you a nice smooth background. It's gonna absorb a lot of those scattering X-rays. And not many people are plating a material like molybdenum, so it doesn't uh, interfere with the actual analyte that you're measuring. And we can measure down to a concentration around 100 parts per million. So, um, so this isn't going to be able to measure like wastewater or something for contaminants down the parts per million, parts per billion range, but you can, you can measure the, the plating analytes. And, and why our customers use this is because, again, you, you, know, you can monitor the concentration over time that will control the, the time of the plating, um, you know, some of the settings you need to, to apply as far as temperature, uh, current for electroplating, things of that nature. So it's just good to monitor to, to uh, make sure your process is consistent. Um, it's fast, you don't have to dilute the sample, you know, something like AA or ICP, which is typically a method that's used for solution analysis, you know, it, it, requires sort of a stepwise process to dilute the sample, uh, put it in there, you know, calibrate it. It requires, you know, sort of specialized personnel, especially ICP, it's kind of a tricky method to, to run. And, um, you know, so if you've already got an XRF for plating thickness measurement, you might as well use it for solution analysis because you've already got the personnel trained. You just pull a few drops, pop it in there, put it in the machine, run it. And you can do it right there in-house. You don't have to send samples out to a lab or anything of that nature. So that's, again, just sort of a, a dual purpose of the, the, the coating thickness measurement uh, that our platers do appreciate. And uh, we have a wide range at Bowman uh, for plating thickness and solution analysis that can you know, basically do any of these applications that I've discussed. And we've got all kinds of different sort of chamber sizes and different hardware configurations for the different uh, applications that I discussed. And I'd be more than happy to talk more about that. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Be happy to 
entertain any questions you might have. So I have a question, Zach. If you had a, didn't know the order which elements are coated onto a substrate, could you work that out? If you had some steel with copper and gold on top, could you tell which is nearest to the steel, which is not on nearest to the steel? Yeah, good question, Tony. That can be kind of tricky to do. I mean, in the case like you you explain, like you got steel and you've got copper and I think did you said gold. Yeah. Yeah. So you would do sort of a stepwise approach. I mean, the spectrum is going to tell you all the information you have, right? So you've got your raw spectrum. So if you looked at, if you had the capability to put a copper foil over gold and measure that, and then do a gold foil over copper and look at the different, you know, uh, spec, you know, overlay the spectrum and then compare that to your sample. That would give you some insight, but it does get a little bit tricky in that case if you don't know, because, you know, it's, it's all, all of the signal is coming all together in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it can be sort of, sort of difficult to backtrack and figure out what's coming from where unless you have sort of the different parts that represent how, you know, one A over B and B over A <laughs> might look. Um, you know, what's, what's fortunate in our world is we're typically working with manufacturers that are controlling the process or customers that are getting the materials in from the platers and they know what their, that process was called out. So luckily we don't, we don't run into that very often. Um, but in that case, yeah, we would have to do sort of a stepwise investigative process to figure that out. So again, it can be challenging. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, I've just got one, Zach. Have you ever done any work with um, mixed lanthanide oxides at all as the um, thin layer? I, a, a little bit here and there. Yes, I have. And, um, you know, th those are definitely measurable because they're right in that range that we can measure, you know, basically anything above, anything that's fluorescing above about one and a half KeV, we can measure. And so depending on the thickness range you're working with, it, it could be something that we can measure. Do you, do you know around what thickness range? You, no, you not ideally, no. Okay. Well, I mean, what, what's, what's a, can you give me an idea of what element you might work with in that case? Um, possibly um, lanthanum, neodymium, and um, prasidymium. Okay, I'm just uh, looking over at my chart here. So, yeah, okay, so when you look at the energy, so for, for something like those, you know, lanthanum, neodymium, we're probably going to be looking at the L lines, which are going to be around four to five kV. And so you can compare that to something like uh, vanadium or chromium. So when I look at that, we're probably going to be measuring somewhere around, uh, you know, a few nanometers up to around 20 microns of thickness would be the measurable range for those elements. Okay. So it's all about that, all about those energy ranges that they fluoresce at.